You know, we're all taught that we're supposed to manage our customer expectations, but what if we've got that all wrong? Let's talk about it on The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shaw. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of The Buyer's Mind, where we investigate exactly what's going on in the brains of prospects who are considering a purchase decision. This podcast is all about taking a stroll through the buyer's mind. It's about knowing the customer so well that that sale begins to roll out right in front of you. I'm your host, Jeff Shore. You can read the full bio in the show notes, or you can hop over to jeffshore.com. And if you're not following us on Twitter, uh, why not? It's really simple, at Jeff Shore. And we post every day on Twitter and also repost uh, stuff, a lot of stuff from uh, the experts that are out there. Today, we're going to be talking to one of our real superstars uh, in the sales guru world. Uh, Tiffany Bova is the real deal. Uh, we're going to talk about, among other things, managing buyer expectations. But stick around because we're going to completely turn that conversation on its head. I think we have uh, largely gotten this wrong up to that point. Uh, as always, joined by our show producer, Paul Murphy. Murphy, you're just back from vacation. Are, are you still on a, a post-vacation high? I'm on a post-vacation lag is what I'm on. I'm trying to recover from the jet <laughs> lag. You know, you, you go across the That's pond right, yeah. from over the Atlantic because I went to the UK um, and to right. Ireland. It's two separate things. Don't confuse mm -hmm. them. You'll get in big trouble. Yeah, right. Um, but right. yeah, just recovering from the jet lag. Give us one scene from your trip to uh, England and Ireland. I think Wales was in there too. Uh, give us one scene that you're going to look back and you go, I'm never going to forget that. Oh, well, my beautiful wife on the beach is uh, the this, this scene that I have. Uh, <laughs> and the beaches are not like suntan beaches like Southern California. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's more like right. Northern California, Oregon, uh, just beautiful yeah, rocky right. coastline uh, and just mm -hmm. enjoying just the, the beautiful views there and a wonderful boat ride seeing the Cliffs of Moher. Mm. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Jealous. Uh, well, welcome back. We missed you. Uh, well, let's uh, let's start off here with our quote of the day. And it's uh, consistent with the topic as we're going to be talking about managing customer expectations. And this is from the great Charles Dickens, who says, no one is useless in the world who lightens the burdens of another. Uh, that is something that in sales we should put up on our wall. No one is useless in this world who lightens the burdens of another. And there's that argument that uh, people who are coming in to us, they need our help, they are burdened, and we have that opportunity. And sales really is service to such an extent. Helping a customer understand what they are getting into is a valuable part of that service. So stop thinking of setting expectations as a means of putting a muzzle on your customer or telling them just to back it down, uh, see it as a way to help them enjoy the process, to have a greater peace of mind about the process. And we're going to dive into that on a deeper level with our guest today. We want to let you know that the podcast is always brought to you by our good friends at Home Street Bank, not just our show sponsor. This is my lender. I used Home Street in my last home purchase. It was a fantastic experience, really smooth transaction. Uh, the people at Home Street Bank were professional, dependable, great rates, great service. If you're a real estate professional and you're looking for somebody to take really good care of your customer, you're just not going to find better than HomeStreetBank.com. So whether it's banking, home loans, credit lines, you name it, go to HomeStreetBank.com. You can learn more. That's HomeStreetBank.com. All right, here's our sales tip of the day, and it is to ask check-in questions all along the way. Now, this seems like a really simple question, and it might almost sound a little bit elementary, but it doesn't happen enough. Just stay with me here, because the question itself is not where the power is. It's the meaning behind the question. The question sounds something like this. How are we doing? How are we doing? So here I am, I'm working with my customer, I'm explaining some aspect of uh, the product or service, I, I'm talking a little bit about what's going on, but I take a break and I ask, hey, how are, how are we doing? I, I know I've shared a lot here, you, you, you guys doing okay? 
Are, are you with me? Does this making sense? Sometimes you just need to slow it down because you do not always know what your customer is thinking. And there may be times when a customer simply needs permission to share. So get into the habit of just asking that check-in question. Hey, just want to pause here. Just how are we doing? Are you guys doing all right? Are you having fun? Are you enjoying this? If there's anything I can help you with, I don't want you to be bashful. Please let me know. Use your check-in questions and use them often. Before we get to our interview, I want to tell you about an opportunity here, and that's to be involved in our 4-2 Academy. Our 4-2 Formula Academy, this is an intensive training program specifically for real estate sales professionals, where we're using modern selling strategies and skills just for today's buyers, just for today's market. The 4-2 formula is the core real estate principle that we talk about at Shore Consulting, but it's going to give you uh, several days and actually spread out over the course of an entire quarter, a program that will allow you to just transform your presentation. We put so many people through the 4-2 Formula Academy, always with tremendous results. You can go to jeffshore.com slash events to learn more about the 4-2 Formula Academy. All right, hey, let's get to our interview. Uh, Tiffany Bova is the global customer growth and innovation evangelist at Salesforce. That's a kind of a big title. I'm looking forward to unpacking that uh, with her. But the resume is extremely impressive. Recognized in 2014 as one of the most powerful and influential women in California by the National Diversity Council, a top 50 marketing thought leader by Brand Quarterly Magazine in 2016, and Inc. Magazine's 37 sales experts you need to follow on Twitter. Uh, Tiffany is a very highly sought after keynote speaker. She's delivered over 250 keynote presentations around the globe, over 300,000 people on sales transformation and on business model innovation. Uh, she's a regular contributor to uh, the HuffPost, uh, Harvard Business Review, Wharton Business Radio on Sirius XM, Forbes, uh, plus uh, a number of uh, leading podcasts. And now we are thrilled to have her with us on The Buyer's Mind. You can learn all you need to learn about Tiffany at tiffanybova.com. That's Tiffany with an I, B O V A dot com, and we'll put that in the show notes. So, welcome, Tiffany. Glad to have you with us. Oh, thanks for having me, Jeff. Hey, this will be fun. You're you're really in a very interesting place in time because you're trying to help sellers keep up with a buying mentality that seems to be changing uh, almost by the minute. It seems both fascinating and frustrating at the same time. Uh, I would agree. I'd say, you know, I, I, I like to kind of call myself a recovering seller, <laughs> which just means that uh, I no longer carry a quota. And, uh, you know, every day I fight, fight the good fight to try to make sure that the salespeople out there have everything they need to be successful, regardless of, of where they work, uh, really. Uh, but ultimately, I'd say this, that having carried a bag and, and carried a quota and then run sales teams and then you know, watch them and study them in the decade I was at Gartner and, and now here with Salesforce, uh, this is the most disruptive I've seen the customer against the way sales approaches its processes. I think that's where it is the most disruptive, is in the process side of selling, not necessarily the art side of selling. Uh, and, and that is not slowing down anytime soon. So t tell me more about that. When when you're talking about the process side of selling, I mean, we look at what has happened with technologies that has made it in many ways uh, more effective for the sales professional, for the practitioner. But you're suggesting that th there's a big shift for consumers, for the actual buyers, as they're doing uh, their research, their homework. Unpack that a little bit. Yeah, so so I'd say yes to both. I'd say, you know, there's been so much research out there about just how much further the buyer is through their own journey. You know, mm -hmm. whether you listen to CEB stats or Gartner stats or anybody else's, you know, when you look at, you've had kind of north of 60% of their journey already done. And I think that's that's been uh, talked about now for the past couple of years. And, and while I think that that percentage uh, has gotten a lot of traction, I'm not so interested in the percentage, the actual percentage number. I'm more interested in the fact that it's different, that the buyer is just further along than they ever were in the past. That to me has impact, whether it's 10%, 20, 50, or you know, 65, whatever the number is. 
So that journey that the buyer is on is what I meant by saying that the sales process is what's getting so disrupted because mm -hmm. we as salespeople used to control the conversation. We used to control the drip of information we would give to a customer about our product, about our service, about our reference accounts, about our pricing, uh, about you know uh, what we did. That was dripped from sales, whether it be in face-to-face -face meetings or mailers uh, or trade shows, et cetera. And so that has been flipped on its head where a lot of those introductory conversations that sales would have with, with customers or prospects as they were beginning their journey are no longer necessary or relevant. Mm -hmm. So that's why I mean that it's been very disruptive on the process because now sales has to almost yeah, you know, to use kind of a sports analogy, you know, it, it's if you if you start if it's football, right? If you start on the twenty yard line, and you have to run eighty yards to score a touchdown, if you're in the U.S., uh, <laughs> and now basically you're starting on the sixty yard line, or the fifty yard line, or the mm -hmm. forty yard line, you mm -hmm. only have thirty or forty yards to go. I'm guessing that the team would not use the same plays to go the last 30 yards as they would to go a full 80. Right. Yeah, you know, they might use more passes mm -hmm. and less running and then as they got closer to the to the red zone they might mm -hmm. run some more what whatever the case might be mm -hmm. and I think that that that's what I mean by it has to change because the plays sales would do by no means should be the same as they were as if they were starting back from zero again. You know, I, I'm thinking back to when I started my sales career, which was pre-internet, and right, we sort of the knowledge is power time, and 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 I could sit there and I could say I've got this this armful of information, and you may have this piece of information, and you may have this piece of information, but. I think I'm going to hold on to this piece of information because I might be able to use it later on. And and I was actually trained at one point: do not give the customer all of the information. You you need a reason to be able to get back in touch with them. So I'm going to ask you to hold stuff back. And I look at that advice today, and I think, my personal opinion, that's comical. That's that's a ridiculous piece of advice because the information is already out there. So my concern here is even as I'm hearing you talk about this, is that uh, woe to the sales professional who doesn't understand uh, uh, th that shift, that change, because they're playing an entirely different role. They just don't know it yet. Yeah. And I would say that uh, I, I totally agree. And so that exact example you gave about not giving, you know, saying that kind of drip of information, right? And your manager would say, don't give this because you need a reason and value to reach back out to them in a week or two, right? You want to have something to tell them. Sure. That's what I meant by the process shifting. Mm -hmm. That has that has very little to do with the art of selling. It has everything to do with the process by which you're being trained. Is it spin selling? Is it, you know, whatever it is in sort of, you know, you're going to call a hundred people, 10 people are going to call you back five meetings, you know, et cetera, right? That very structured process uh, is no longer as effective because the customer has different uh, expectations of you. But the one thing I sort of double click on here is that I don't necessarily think that this is only the responsibility of the salesperson, the individual contributor, because unfortunately, as a salesperson, you have very little control of your day-to-day -day activities. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I think salespeople can control every day is their behavior in front of a customer. And outside of that, there's very little they can control, right? Because you're being told, call 10 people, call five people, three meetings, you know, two demos, you know, you kind of have this prescription of productivity you have to go through every day. Mm -hmm. You know, it's named accounts, it's verticals, it's by geo, you know, here's your call list, like mm -hmm. go forth and conquer. Right. You have very little to control there. I actually think this is the responsibility and where it's falling apart in this new buyer power and this sales process that's getting disrupted is in sales management. Because until sales managers give the flexibility and freedom and permission and empowerment to the salesperson to actually maybe not do all the things that they were prescribed to do every day through this heavy process oriented role they play and allow them to actually be responsive to customer demands and what they may want at any given time is very different for managers who have grown up either as sales reps or as managers, right? Being very productivity driven. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So, so are you concerned then about the human side, about the uh, about losing a little bit of, of the connection uh, in in the wash of of, uh, of of tools, of techniques, of process shifts, of everything else? Are are, are you worried that salespeople are going to lose a little bit of that uh, interpersonal soft science skills? No, I actually think the opposite. Mm -hmm. I think that the soft skills are going to become more important and the prescriptive uh, productivity metrics that have, you know, very much railed, uh, you know, a sales rep into the day to day is going to have to loosen up. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say the complete opposite, because I think now it is much I think the science automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of those things now start to remove a lot of the guesswork that salespeople had every day. You know, it was mm -hmm. just kind of call a hundred people and then it was a numbers game, right? If you right. call a hundred people, 20 are going to call you back. Right. Now it's, do you need to call a hundred people mm -hmm. or can the system through intelligence, through your CRM and, and, and AI uh, and some of the predictive capabilities, can it push out and say to you, Hey, based on what we see is happening, you know, on all of our intelligence and data, we think these 20 customers are the right ones for you to call today. And now you only need to call 20 people and you're going to get a much higher return rate on response or moving deals forward than you would if you were just cold calling 100 and dialing for dollars. And so then you really have to use those soft skills of to your point, I can't just hold information back and that's the value I have to bring. I actually have to do some homework and understand what kind of value I can bring at each of those human touch points. Right. And it has to be something more than a customer can find on their own. Let's uh, let's see how you shake out on this. I, I belong to this tribe, if you will, of sales uh, authors, speakers, uh, trainers. And uh, in, the, in that tribe, there's a very clear line here about how people feel about cold calling and some of us are on uh, far on one side and some of us are heavy on the other uh how do you shake out on the whole topic of cold calling yeah it, and so i i would put cold calling i put social selling i'd put you know all training mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i put all that into those buckets of you're going to either be on one side of it or the other side of it and mm -hmm. You know, many people have built um, very healthy businesses and and living off of you know helping um, individual contributors and entire companies improve on something like cold calling as an example, mm -hmm. right? I think cold calling in the way that it used to be two decades ago mm -hmm. is not cold calling of today. You mm -hmm. could still pick up the phone and cold call someone, mm -hmm. but you better be you know ten times as sharp and have you know a lot more information. Uh, be much more informed. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to be better at cold calling and have a really compelling value prop and storyline in order to get someone on the other end who was not expecting your call uh, to engage with you. So do I think it's dead? Absolutely not. You know, it's just like a cold email or, you know, connecting with someone on LinkedIn or walking up to them cold at an event, you don't know them. I mean, I think that that kind of approach still works mm -hmm. hands down. But I think in all this time of noise, uh, you have to be even, uh, you know, it isn't about just um, engaging with someone, you have to be really engaging mm -hmm. the, those two things. So, uh, and I feel the same way about social selling. So I, I don't think cold calling is dead. I think the way we used to do cold calling is going to get less and less effective over time because the buyers are not going to tolerate that kind of, you don't know who I am and you're just sort of, you know, dialing down some list that you got today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, why not have a bot do that? Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Sure. Um, Look. So the ubiquity of information says that there's no reason why it should ever be totally cold, as if I have no idea who you are. Exactly. And so, so that's why I don't like the term cold calling mm -hmm. because I think, you know, it has carried with it a connotation over decades of yeah. cold calling meant literally cold calling. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. And so the it, the cold in its you know quote unquote is no longer reality. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no reason you should ever cold call, right? Because you could go and do a lot of research up front. You know, you can um, find out, you know, uh, who their connections are, reach out, find out about the business. I mean, there's so much more information. So is it really warm calling now? Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. is it, you know, and, and does intelligence actually make it hot calling mm -hmm. calling now? Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Where the intelligence is, is literally saying, as I was just mentioning, right, in, instead of calling 100, 
Tiffany, I think you should call these 20 mm -hmm. and I'm going to learn the, you know, I being the artificial intelligence and machine, I'm going to learn from those 20 on what happens and what you en end up entering into the CRM system. Mm -hmm. I'm going to learn that those 20 only of them, four of them were really great. 10 of them were kind of medium and, and the remaining six were not so good. Right. So I'm going to learn from that. So the next time I tell you to call 20, seven are going to be great. You know what I mean? And so over time, I get smarter and smarter, not the person, right? But the systems mm -hmm. get smarter. And so, you know, it should really be this uh, very targeted, specific account based call, mm -hmm. you know, with a play behind it that is compelling to the customer. Right. Let's uh, let's chat here about uh, the customer and the changing customer here. And and you recently wrote that customers are ultimately becoming far more disruptive than the technology itself. That's something that you alluded to earlier here in this conversation. How, what do you do to try and stay on top of those changing buying trends? Because it's uh, to me, there are times when I step back and look at it, and I'm just over, I'm just overwhelmed by how quickly things are changing. Uh, at, especially as, as regards the uh, access to information. What, what do you do to stay on top of uh, buying changes in the buying trends? Yeah, I, I'd say this. I'd say, you know, as individual contributing sales reps, I'm a firm believer in always being a student of your profession. Mm -hmm. um, when I was carrying a quota, I'd spend, you know, a certain number of hours a week, whether it was, you know, an hour a day or whether it was over a weekend uh, or if it was while I was flying, uh, you know, to read magazines and uh, around periodicals and journals in particular verticals I was selling into, or, you know, I'd read reports or listen to podcasts or webinars, whatever it might be, to really make sure that I understood at least what customers were asking me. I didn't need to know the answer, but at least I could process what they were asking so I could go find the answer. So it was a lot about understanding. So making personal investment uh, in your own time, because if you're if you're not investing in you, nobody is going to. So I think the first thing is making those uh, carving out that time to invest in the profession that you have chosen to be in. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd say you know always continually learning. The second thing I'd say is that I don't necessarily believe that this is so much drastically different than we've always behaved. Mm -hmm. Um, especially at high performing sellers level where they usually always showed up with you know more information they were more prepared they really doubled down on relationships they were super good at networking uh you know they were always about adding value they always put the customer first they would mm -hmm. you know come back internally and kind of fight the, the customers fight for them you know inside the organization whether it was for you know delayed products or something wasn't working right or whatever the case might be now the challenge is, is that everybody has to do that mm -hmm. because you can't kind of fake your way through, well, they'll find it on their own or I'll give it to them later or because the, the customer, especially on the B2B side, as individuals have been trained on their B2C side where they have consumer expectations in the business world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the way I behave in my consumer life, I want to be able to have that same kind of interaction in my business life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd say that it, it can be overwhelming if you look at it in its totality versus trying to just break it down into things that are manageable and digestible and kind of pick one thing that you want to improve on over a period of time. And the things that you're not very good at, don't necessarily try to make yourself great at it. You know, always sort of pivot towards the things you're you're really good at. Double down there, and then you know, surround yourself with people who can help you on the things you may be not so strong at. Let's uh, let's pivot here to the topic of uh, setting expectations. I know this is a, a specialty topic of yours. Too often, in my experience and my observation, we look at the motive for setting expectations being how to keep the company out of trouble. I want I want to set these expectations so that I can essentially uh, put a muzzle on you, um, Mr. and Mrs. Customer. So, how do we let the customer know that? You know, we're just not, maybe that we're not going to do what we want them to do. Somehow I have to believe there's more to it than that when it comes to the whole whole category of setting expectation. Well, I think that this, this uh, brings up a great, great topic, which is this whole notion now of customer success. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a term that has gained a lot of momentum uh, lately. You know, that's customer experience is definitely one that is 
uh, is big and and people talk about a lot. And you know, in my in my last life, we we used to say customer experience is the new competitive battleground. That if you know you're not delivering great experiences across both the product and the service and the sales cycle, et cetera, that that you know people will vote with their wallets mm-hmm. uh, and their loyalty. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now this customer success concept is really brands making sure that the customers that buy from them are successful, quote unquote, using whatever it is that they're buying from them, right? So is it a computer? Is it a cell phone? Is it a car? Is it a you know couch? Is it a television? Like what is it? That whatever it was that they were looking to do, that they that they had they found success in using your brand, uh, in satisfying whatever demand you know or need they had or job they needed to have done to sort of use Clayton Christensen's you know that everything is about about a job. And so if if you think about uh, customer success, um, that is the expectation they have. But I would say that customers also realize, uh, as we all do, it can't be perfect all the time. But what's really important is always making sure you're transparent. If something goes wrong, that you're coming out ahead of that and saying, hey, listen, you know, this wasn't done particularly correct, or we really dropped the ball here, or, you know, this, this, uh, you know, you got something that is just um, not working, so we're going to replace it. You have to always kind of have the, the temperament and the, and the culture of, we're always going to put the customer first. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if their expectations are unrealistic, it's really about sharing with them, how do we find a, a common ground around those expectations? But know that I always have your best interest in mind. There are just things that I can't accommodate because I'm sure you understand I'm, I'm in business, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I can't just say, I'm going to give this to you for free, or I'm just going to send you 10 more of them because I've made you upset or, you know, whatever the case might be. But I think people just want to be treated like people and, mm-hmm. and have that uh, transparency and understanding around expectations. Yeah, I think part of this comes down to the how we use the word policy. I hate the word policy. I hate it passionately. And, and the reason that I do is because if, if you show me 100 policies that a company writes, 99 will be in favor of uh, the company uh, or the one for the customer. I, I think we'd probably be well served if we're ever writing a policy to imagine that there's a customer standing in the room at the time that we're writing it. Uh, but w- I, I think what we often find where we get into trouble is we think that setting expectations is about how do we creatively tell the customer to sit down and shut up. Uh, Quite the opposite, right, from the concept of customer success. Well, I, I think that it's it comes down to culture. I mean, if you look at some of the things that have happened in you know the last six months with with the airline industry, you know, and we, we don't need to go into great detail on that. But but I think that if you think about the culture, that uh, you know it was. Um, I, I was actually much more disappointed at the fact that nobody stood up and sort of defended the guy <laughs> on the plane, uh, or that even the people who work there mm-hmm. like stepped in and said, "Whoa, hold on a second, Time, this is not our culture. Mm-hmm. You know, that this is not what we stand for." I mean, unless he was brandishing a gun or, or something was really terrible. At the end of the day, I mean, he, he, they were just trying to get him off the plane. Mm-hmm. So I think that you have to, if the customer is always sort of you know, first and the culture always defaults to that unless it just makes no sense, Mm -hmm. you're, you're going to tend to err on the right side of things. You know, like I said, you can't, you know, just, if you're a customer service agent and you go, well, I'm doing what's right for the customer and I've credited everybody who's calling in, that's not necessarily the right thing for the customer. Mm -hmm. It's most definitely not going to be the right thing for, for the company. And so how you handle that has a lot to do, I think with just going back to what I said a little bit ago, right? Empowering at that manager level, empowering the individual contributor to do what's best and right for the customer and the business. And sometimes it would go against what you normally would have done. So let's just pick a credit, you know, on something that, that, uh, you know, the customer, um, you had a, a situation that was really extenuating circumstances and the best thing to do would be, you know what, ship it back to us. We, we will send you a new one at no cost. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's the right thing to do for the customer. You couldn't do it every time. Right. Right. So I, I think that it has come, for me, it really comes down to empowerment and enabling people to make the right decisions without having to go through against those 100 policies, 99 of which are very company centric and not customer centric. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, th- one last thing here that, that I want to ask a question about you, but but just on the on the topic of uh, your expertise, uh, you work a lot in the area of brand loyalty. Do you think brand loyalty is harder or easier to get and to sustain than in eras past? 
Uh, it's a great question because I, I think that now companies are getting um, much more focused on what metrics can they manage against that are more customer centric. So net promoter score, customer satisfaction, lifetime value, mm -hmm. churn rates, you know, the things that are showing the health of the customer that all customers are not created equal. And, you know, that you don't need to necessarily be completely responsive to every single customer the same way. And that's where this intelligence and analytics will really play a huge role in understanding why you're losing customers, why you're acquiring customers, why customers buy more from you than others, and, and how do you replicate those kinds of behaviors. And I think companies have been a little bit more uh, hesitant uh, around pivoting towards those kinds of metrics because they feel like they're too soft and, and they're not quite as uh, you know, numbers sort of are good or bad, right? And it's easy. You can say, look, we gained 100 customers, we lost 10. Mm -hmm. But if I said, you know, we gained 100 customers, we lost 10, but the 10 we lost were actually losing us money, and the, and the 100 we gained, we're now gaining with a higher share of wallet and an average sale price. They're staying with us two or three years longer than the average. We're actually able to upsell and cross-sell to them three times more than we used to, like those kinds of metrics and statistics uh, will, will drive the right kind of behavior around this customer loyalty. Because customers don't want to switch, it's a hassle, mm -hmm. but it's become so easy to switch. Uh, but just because you make a mistake one time doesn't mean someone's just going to you know, bail on you. I, right. I think that um, you know, there are parts of my life from a travel perspective, because I'm on the road quite a bit, where I'm loyal to brands at a fault, right? Because I'm so committed. It's been so long. Me switching a brand would make no sense. I mean, they'd have to really do something wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I put up with the little mistakes along the way because all in all, it's a better experience than I'd get elsewhere because of my status, you know, in, in a particular loyalty program. Mm -hmm. um, on other things that are small and insignificant, if I have a bad experience, I'm gone very quickly. And I just don't even give them a chance for a, a second try. Uh, and I and I will be very loyal around great experiences. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. All right, let, let's uh, wrap it up with this. I, let's talk about you for just a second. You, you've got uh, a, a very impressive resume. You've got the academic pedigree behind you. You're clearly a very driven person. Uh, uh, is is that difficult for you to sustain that drive, or or, or, or do you feel like it? No, nah, this is just who I am. I, I don't know how. I don't know any other speed except forward and uh, quickly. Yeah, that's probably it. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, are you easily bored? Uh, I am easily bored, but um, I rarely get bored mm -hmm. because I uh, I do, you know, I, I have had the absolute pleasure of, you know, so the you know year and a half I've been here, but the 10 years before that, uh, I got to spend all my time at Gartner really sort of speaking around the world to lots of different kinds of companies and I learned a ton. Like I thought I went into that job having run a division of Gateway Computers as a sales leader. And I was in sort of the hosting, web hosting space very early. I was the beta client for Eloqua and Constant Contact. I was super early in recurring revenue models and you know, cloud services, et cetera. And you know, I thought I was doing some really interesting uh, and compelling work. And then when I got to, to Gartner, probably about two years in, I was like, wow, I don't know very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I had to really work hard at, at becoming more academic because I'm at, at my core, right? I'm a seller and I and, uh, had to learn how to be a marketer really and then running customer service as well. So kind of all customer facing. Um, but I spend a lot of time, e even now, you know, it's probably two hours a day, just sort of researching, reading, listening, learning mm -hmm. and so that keeps me from being bored if you will yeah. uh, but i'm also super motivated by uh trying to uh, help customers be more successful mm -hmm. uh and you know give them give them hope on the art of the possible of how technology can yes be disruptive but be very very empowering especially at the salesperson level i i always get bothered when I hear people say that, you know, technology is going to replace X percent of the salesperson. I just, I just don't agree with that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's going to be automation as there always has been, 
Um, but people still like to buy from people in certain categories and, and want to speak to humans. So, I mean, I think at the end of the day, uh, salespeople have just really got to step up their game. And I think, you know, if I can make any impact on on uh, their performance and their ability to see that it's just going to work itself out if, they, if they're committed to, to, to working the process, then, then I've done my job every day. Mm -hmm. Right, that's fantastic counsel. I really appreciate that. There's that, that concept that I, I teach all the time, know everything, share what matters. You, you can't really share what matters until you know everything. So there's the idea of getting really, really strong because you never know what specific piece of information or counsel or guidance is gonna help that customer standing in front of you. Tiffany, just fantastic interview. Just loved it, uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, they it, People can learn more, they could follow your blog, they could follow you on social, basically all things uh, Tiffany Bova at tiffanybova.com. Tiffany with an I, we'll put that in the show notes. Tiffany, thank you so much for being on the program. Oh, thanks for having me, Jeff. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Well, Murph, uh, I think we can agree that uh, Tiffany Bova is uh, sort of on the smart side, huh? Brilliant woman, brilliant. I, I just loved everything she had to share about uh, customer success versus customer experience and so many of the things we just unpacked together. I'll tell you what, her comment that the buyer is further along than ever, this is something that uh, really resonated with me because I, I, I've been teaching this on a regular, trying to pound this into the brains of sales professionals that uh, if you get this wrong, if you think that your buyer is farther behind in the process or less informed than they are, this is going to be a real problem because, and I'm sure you've seen this, Murph, if you're out shopping for something, maybe it's a tech item, uh, how much you already know about the product is going to have a dramatic impact on your buying process, right? It does. And sometimes I know a little bit more than the salesperson uh, and I don't need them to tell me about it. I just need to know if they have it. Yeah, it's pretty simple sale at that point, right? I also loved uh, the, the concept uh, that uh, Tiffany pointed out, the difference between uh, engaging and being engaging. So it's one thing to say that I'm going to uh, engage you in the process, or, or I'm, I'm going to, uh, to use that almost as a tool to move the sale along, versus just that strong, deep-rooted relational sense of being engaging, of, of how do I really connect with you. That I think that's just a very powerful way to be able to, to look at it. And then the whole concept of customer success, I, I could not agree more. I think that this is going to be the, the, the appropriate buzzwords that we're going to hear moving forward. It's not just about customer satisfaction. I'm not a huge fan of the phrase customer satisfaction. I, I, don't, I didn't start out my business to make my customers satisfied. I, I want them to be successful. So the idea of customer success is really, really powerful. Just a really fantastic interview with Tiffany Bova. Well, hey, listen, as we had another wrap up, I want to remind you that your customer needs you and your customer needs you in a big way. Now, they may not think that at first and they certainly may not act like it, but they need you. So here's the question. When your, com when your customer comes to you out of their fear, out of their anxiety, and sometimes out of a, a approach that is curt and a little uh, ill-tempered even, will you outlast that? Because your customer still needs you. And I want to make sure that you're keeping this in mind, that all of those defensive postures that your customer takes, that is not a reflection of their character. That is situational. That is an expression of their fear, of their concerns, of the hangups that they brought through, and it might very well have to do with the very last salesperson that they met. Your job is to outlast that, because if your customer comes in and is somehow uh, defensive or combative or even just flat out negative, uh, how you receive that is going to make all the difference in the world. You go head to head with a negative customer and you are sunk. But but if you look and you say, I'm going to bring all of this positive energy because that's what I decided to do even before you walk through the door. Now this is a game and you don't lose. Because when you think about it, if the customer is negative and you go negative, does the customer win? No, the customer doesn't win. Nobody wins. Nobody wins until that conversation turns positive. Out 
last that initial expression you're going to get from that customer. Stay with them. Make that unilateral decision as to the positive energy you're going to bring to the conversation. And you'll bring that customer along and that's when they're going to love you the most. Well, hey, listen, I, I hope you've subscribed to the podcast. That really means a lot to us. If you love it, a review would mean even more. But if you would consider posting a link to the podcast on your social media page, that would mean the world to us. Well, that's a wrap on today's episode of The Buyer is Mind. As always, we hope you enjoyed it. You can find everything you need at jeffshore.com. But until next time, go out there and change someone's world. Change someone's world.